we were treating acute myeloid leukemia with 7 and 3 in 1977 when I first arrived in this country. Today we are still doing the same in 2018. What is the best way forward to change it by 2028? Yeah, it's a very difficult question, as evidenced by the question itself. Uh, if it were easy, it would have been solved, uh, number one. Uh, my perspective on this, uh, and it's based on, again, our experience in drug development, the biotech business, the pharma space, uh, is, is the way novelty is approached is usually with an enormous amount of resistance. So the difficulty in making any advance, uh, even with resources, with persistence, uh, with excellence and quality, uh, it's just really, really hard. Uh, I think the other challenge is what you hear over and over is everything takes so long. Why does it take so long? Well, it takes long because it's difficult, but people have no patience. So what that does is it eliminates and most promising discoveries or advances don't even have a chance to be evaluated in a clinical setting. So, and cytotoxics are effective. They do uh, something and uh, they offer benefits, although limited and they have toxicities. So I think at the very least, uh, effort should be placed in making cytotoxics more efficient and less toxic, uh, at the very least. Uh, and then giving a chance for a drug development pathway that uh, favors innovation and creativity without so much pressure in um, the short-term uh, revenue, which is really unfortunately where, where where the business coming and uh, most therapies that unfortunately don't have a chance to be developed. So moving forward, what can we do differently by 2028 if we are to change the outcome for our patients who have common cancers like lung and prostate and uh, colorectal? I think you would need to reward creativity and novelty. Uh, things coming waves. So you have the gene therapy wave, then you have the stem cell wave, then you have the immunotherapy wave, and then ADCs, antibodies. Uh, and then everybody just runs to that, all the investors run to that. And uh, it's always about what's easier to understand. And what's easier to understand is usually what already failed. So I would hope that uh, in the drug development space we could see some more sophistication and open-mindedness. Great. So my second question is, is three and a half million papers have been published in the area of cancer, 135,000 just in the last year alone. But there's a staggering disconnect between these biologic insights and their translation into improved therapies for our patients. What are we doing wrong, Renata? I think there's a number of aspects that drive uh, science these days um, and in, in the lab we usually joke don't confuse reviewers comments with reality <laughs> in order to publish and get funding you have to honor reviewers comments right yes. uh, reviewers comments on our reality so you end up in this cycle in which uh, in order to survive within the system not always you have to do the right thing and put your time in the right direction. So uh, is the literature really reflective of what's really meritorious? How many times do you open an issue of cell nature science and you say, why is this paper here? <laughs> uh, so, so is the body of literature really translated into real advances? I'm not sure. So where are the real advances? Uh, Aren't we observing an, an enormous lack of creativity these days, uh, a, a lack of drive? And I think it's just there's some fundamental limitations as to how science and good science is rewarded. Uh, how do we fix that? I think is not my place to say. I think it's not going to change fast. Uh, but I think there's some people that really can make a difference. 
and um, and try to be multidisciplinary and, and, and multidimensional uh, and and not worry so much about the fast rewards uh, the immediate rewards the financial benefits uh, the visibility or or again what's the definition of success uh, in my mind is making a contribution and I think if scientists could think more along these lines uh, we could do better excellent this next question I'm really has uh, more implications for clinicians but I'm going to ask you because you are a clear thoughtful thinker the fact that children respond to the same treatment better than adults for cancers seems to suggest that the biology of the cancer is different, but also that the host is different. Since most cancer incidence increases with age, even having good therapy may not matter because the host is decrepit. Solution. Again, I won't claim to have a solution, as you said. I think this is way above my pay grade. What I can tell you is from my perspective, uh, I do believe there's a lot to be said about precision, precision medicine. Understanding what are the features that unify a certain patient group that, in your case, you're talking about age defining a certain set of characteristics or uh, maybe the disease characteristics that, that have unique features. So being able to define that would be probably uh, contextual in this sense. Um, the immune response in my mind uh, really, I believe, provides tremendous amounts of information about what's going on real time with disease progression. So uh, it's not uh, unreasonable to assume that in children, for example, the immune response is more efficient. It's able to capture things faster and respond faster, be more agile. So that's probably explaining uh, why certain therapies are successful. They have the support of the immune system, which is more robust. Uh, as you age, this changes. So what could be done, for example, to, to mitigate that? Uh, he found a precision medicine way based on the immune response. You discover what the immune system is paying attention to. So you're able to boost that in patients that are deficient in that respect. Uh, and we've had these ideas within our own program. We had proposed ways to figure out what is it the immune system is paying attention to. Can you make a cocktail of antibodies that would be particularly helpful for that group of patients? Uh, and the idea was met with simply uh, a dismissal because apparently this would be financially impossible to accomplish, which I don't believe it would. Um, and uh, uh, so I believe maybe, maybe normalizing the field uh, in which um, you increase the chances of an individual fighting the disease through manipulating specific features that need to be enhanced might be an answer. It's a very unique answer, let me say this. I love it. Next question. You've been working in this field for several decades now. You have great knowledge and experience in the field. If you are given limitless resources today to plan a cure for cancer, what will you do? Yeah, that's a difficult question, and it, it, it comes to a core issue uh, that we talked about. Resources are enabling. They do not create anything. So if you already have an idea, you already have a concept, you already have a promising lead, having unlimited resources would just speed up uh, the validation and eventually the, the success or failure or the triage mechanism for something that will eventually be helpful. Uh, so giving limitless resources, uh, maybe you could even the field and eliminate uh, the deficiencies of the review process, which again, uh, unfortunately these days, I think leaves a lot to desire. Uh, 
uh, a lot of the money goes to people that really do nothing with it. You have multi-million dollar grants granted to people, and you look at it years later, there's absolutely nothing to be said about it. Uh, so again, maybe even in the field, uh, honoring creativity uh, and uh, hopefully increasing the amount of people that can do good work uh, might bring progress. Uh, but again, I don't think resources uh, would enable unless the ideas are there. And uh, allowing people to have these ideas and developing them uh, would be important. So in your opinion, the greatest resource is the human resource, really? Yeah. yeah. Well, final question, uh, again, as I said, this uh, this question may sound clinically oriented, but really it is a question all of us face, either we will we'll face for ourselves or have already faced with a relative or a friend, because almost no one is untouched by cancer now. So my question to you is, offering patients with advanced stage non-curable cancers, palliative but toxic treatments is a service or a disservice in the current therapeutic landscape? It's very interesting that you ask that. Uh, being married to an oncologist, I asked this question of him uh, just recently. and. Uh, and then there's two personal experiences, as you said, because I'm not an MD. I do not see these situations. I do not have to deal with them. Uh, but we do have personal experiences with friends and relatives that face these challenges. So, so again, what are the answers that I hear, uh, particularly from my husband, who tells me like it is? Uh, a, um, one, one puzzle that used to bother me is why would you give somebody or consider a drug a success if you only get a six month increase in survival? Why does that matter? Well, what I hear from oncologists is it gives you time to plan a little bit. It gives you time to organize your life or it gives you time to address certain things that need to be addressed. So there's a reason to go through the suffering and whatever side effects these therapies might uh, cause. Uh, number two, I also see uh, physicians even that get cancer such as brain tumors or pan pancreas cancer. And they say, well, I don't want to be treated because I know it won't work, it won't help. Well, you end up with terrible complications because you do not do anything. Sepsis, painful uh, outcomes. Uh, so again, as, as my hum husband tells me, sometimes you want a cleaner death. So you need to put yourself through these th therapies, even if they're not going to eventually benefit you greatly. And uh, I think the last example is a very close friend of mine. Uh, her mother was diagnosed with a horrible type of tumor. Uh, she wasn't a particularly happy person and uh, wasn't in a good place already and uh, it's, it's close to 90 years old and, and, my, and, and then when offered the opportunity to receive heavily cytotoxic therapy, really got very happy about it and excited about it. I wouldn't say happy, but excited about a prospect. And my friend was saying, you weren't doing well anyway, you didn't look like you wanted to move forward anyway, and now you're going to put yourself through this because you want to leave. So I think a lot of it's up to the patient. Uh, people can really change when faced with a, an enormous challenge. Uh, and again, it's, it's up to them and their physicians to decide what to do. Well, thank you so much for your time. These were really wonderful answers. Thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Have a good day.